Good morning. Good crowd this morning. I'd like to announce on behalf of the WMU, which sponsors the Annie Armstrong offering, we're overjoyed to announce that we not only met our goal of $10,000, but we went over. Why should I be surprised? <laughs> um, with your generous donations, our total is $14,000. Uh, thank you all so much for your generous offering.
Jesus is coming again. There are three stanzas. Join with us. We'll sing all three of those before our morning prayer. Amen. <laughs> Jesus is coming and Stephen has left us. Okay. <laughs> you never know what to expect when you come to First Baptist Somerville, but we have a great time, don't we? Amen. What a wonderful day already to see our exceeded goal in Annie Armstrong, $14,000. And that is going to be used here in North America to help share the gospel. And so we are so excited. Thank you for your sacrificial and generous giving to the Annie Armstrong offering. And this morning we want to welcome you, and we want to welcome those watching by live stream today, and we pray that God will bless you as we celebrate and worship our risen Lord together today. We want to welcome those who are visiting with us. We have some first-time guests with us, and we welcome you. Thank you for coming and sharing with us. If you received a bulletin, there is a side panel. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and then dropping that in our offering boxes, at either exit or you can hand it to uh, myself or to Stephen. You'll see him again. And, uh, he, and we, will, we will certainly try to reach out and minister to you in any way that we can. 
But God has gloriously blessed us in so many ways, hasn't he? Every day is a gift that God gives to us. But the greatest gift of all is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And through him, we have salvation. And in salvation, we have the hope of eternity, of spending in heaven with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this morning, we're going to do something just a little bit different right now. If you don't mind, we're just going to kind of move into invitation, if that's okay with you. I'd like to ask the Doyle family to come, if they would, this morning. Had the privilege of meeting with Monica and Zane Thursday night, and uh, Michael wasn't able with work uh, to be uh, with us, but uh, we are so excited about uh, this family. They are coming to uh, unite with our church, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, Michael. Uh, is a Christian already and has followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Monica has uh, trusted Christ as her Lord and Savior, but she has not uh, been baptized, so she's coming on baptism. And then Zane, he gave his life to the Lord. And uh, so he's coming this morning. And so as a family, they want to come and unite with the Fellowship of First Baptist Church somewhere. Isn't God good? I tell you, it's just so exciting to see what he is doing. And if, you, and if you rejoice with this decision of this precious family, would you give them a good hearty amen and let them know how much we appreciate you, Mike. God bless you. And Zane, we're, we're so proud of you, buddy. God bless you. And Monica, thank you so much. Now, we wanted to do this early because uh, before Zane goes to children's worship, he just wanted to make public his profession of faith in Jesus Christ. So at this time, I'm going to ask our boys and girls, uh, that would like to go to children's worship. Miss Tina's right here. And we've already had a great day, haven't we, already? All right, Brother Stephen. There he is. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, we're going to sing another hymn. Tell me the story of Jesus. The words will be on the screen this time. They may not be as pretty, but... Uh, they, they will be up there. Join with the ensemble as we sing three stanzas. Tell me the story of Jesus.
In the book of Luke, it says on that, on that Sunday morning, after Jesus had risen, there were two men on the way back to Emmaus. Uh, this is a made-up story about what that trip may have been like for those two men as they were making their way home. All at once he walked beside me like he'd been there all along not a stranger but a father who can sense when something's wrong and he answered all my questions and he understood my fears that vanished somehow now that he was he can't you see who walks with you can't you hear who speaks your name can't you feel something stirring in your heart how his words rang strong and true like a wall familiar strain could the past we follow from now on be the I couldn't bear for him to leave me, so I begged him, please, to stay. Spend the evening a few moments before he went his way. Then, like a host, he stood and blessed me, broke the bread and poured the wine. And there was something there I recognized. Something stirring in my heart. How his words rang strong and true, like a once familiar strain. And I know I'll never be the same. I can see. And suddenly I knew 
Yes, I can see. I can see who walks with me. I can hear who speaks my name. I can feel something stirring in my heart. How his words ring strong and true, like a once familiar strain, and I know I'll never be the same. I can see. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Amen. Have you ever heard the words, good grief? Probably the most familiar place that you've heard that is with Charlie Brown. Good grief, Charlie Brown. And the words good grief a lot of times imply a sense of surprise, dismay, and uh, sometimes alarm, even other negative emotions. For instance, good grief, did you really do that? Good grief, you're not going to do that again, are you? And some people see the words good grief as an oxymoron. Now, if you don't know that word, oxymoron is made up of two Greek words, oxy and moron, and oxy means sharp, and moron means dull. So an oxymoron is a sharp dull. And you go, that doesn't make sense, but that's what oxymoron means. Some good examples of that. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, it's the same difference? What about, why don't you act naturally? What about clearly confused? Some of you may be struggling with that right now. How about these, awfully nice, or pretty ugly? How about this one, an exact estimate, or an original copy? How about this, a definite maybe, or you might enjoy this one, a working vacation. Have any of you ever done that before? Some that is always interesting to hear these words together, the Great Depression. Was the Depression great? Or how about this one, the only choice. <laughs> the words good grief. How do these two words fit together? What is the meaning of the word grief? The meaning of the word grief is deep sorrow especially associated with death or suffering or some kind of disaster or difficulty. Some other words for grief would be sorrow, anguish, misery. How can grief be good? Well, especially with death, I'm here to tell you this morning that a Christian can have good grief. So have your Bibles and turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse 13 down through verse 18, and in reverence to the reading of God's Word, would you join me in standing as we, if you are able to, to join with us in the reading of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible, follow along with the, the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. Paul writes these words, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep or those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving and showing to us how that we can experience good grief. I pray that in these next moments that your word will just open up and come so alive to us and where we are in our lives, that your Holy Spirit will be able to take these truths and help to calm our fears, to help bring peace into our troubled lives, and that, Father, we could rest confidently with assurance that you're in total control. Father, thank you that we can experience good grief. Now speak to us as we are listening. Would you take me and hide me behind your cross? May I not be seen or heard, but may Jesus Christ be exalted and lifted up today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. The sermon title, Good Grief, Resurrection Promises. Last year, Javier Garcia and Rodney Reeson and I had the privilege of going down to Mexico to ordain Jaime Lopez to the gospel ministry as he is pastoring a church in Yatsachi, Mexico. And one of the great experiences we had where we were able to visit there in the community, and it's, it's kind of down from the top of the mountain, but we were able to walk up to another little village right on the top of the mountain. And the village where Jaime is pastoring is called Yatsachi El Bajo. But there is another Yatsachi El Alto. And it sat on the very top of the mountain. And as we walked up there, there was a church up there. But there was also a cemetery there. And I want you to look at this picture. This is one of my favorite pictures that I have seen because there is a cemetery sitting beside the church on top of the mountains. And you can see the other mountains in the background. And I thought about this picture as I was preparing this message and thinking about what a beautiful picture that was. Now, there's nothing very exciting. There's nothing very comforting about a cemetery. It brings up all kinds of emotions to us. And many times people, when they visit the cemetery, they go there in sorrow and grief with tears. And I thought about as people would come and visit, and there were a lot of flowers and things placed there on the graves. But I could not help but think about, as I stood a little higher up than that cemetery, taking this picture that when somebody would come to that cemetery, what they would see in the background are the beautiful mountains that describe God's powerful majesty. And that he created this world. And what a view from that cemetery. It's a view that for believers can present hope in place of sorrow with no hope that's what paul said when he said in the very first verse i don't want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep those who have died that you sorrow not like those who sorrow with no hope the bible doesn't tell us that we we don't sorrow the bible doesn't say that we don't grieve we do we are sorrowful when when death takes a loved one from us we grieve, we cry, we weep, and we have sorrow in our heart. But as a child of God, we have something else in our grief, and it's called hope. And the reason that hope is there 
is because of what we celebrated last Sunday. Easter Sunday. It is the holiday in which we come together usually as an entire country to celebrate and recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we looked last week at the powerful message of the resurrection, can you, can you imagine the joy and the, 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 the excitement that came to Jesus' family, to his followers, to his friends, when he rose from the dead? He was alive, and he met with them, and he talked with them, and he ate with them, and he spent 40 days again walking this earth with his family and followers and friends. And the Bible tells us that he who was dead is now alive forevermore. And we celebrated that. Wow, that's wonderful. Our Savior rose from the dead. What does that do for us? What does that mean to me, to you? What we celebrated last week is what gives us cause to celebrate this week and every other week every day of our life for the rest of our life. I want us to think about three resurrection promises out of this text of Scripture this morning and how it really relates to us and how it really impacts our life. First of all, I want you to see that there will be a resurrection of our body. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been promised that one day we too will be resurrected in our body. I want you to see, first of all, in verse 16 that we read to you. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now here he's talking about the body that's been placed back into the ground from which it was created. But that body in the ground is not the individual. That's just the house they lived in while here upon the earth. For the Bible teaches us that to be absent from the body is to what? Be present with the Lord. And so the body lies silent. The body is dead. But the spirit, the soul of man is alive. But one day the Bible tells us that soul and spirit is going to come back and it's going to be reunited with a risen, resurrected body. And that's what the scriptures teach us. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12 says this. 1 Corinthians 13, 12, listen to what it says. For as the body, I'm sorry. Verse 12, 13, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. You see, some people have questioned when when we are in the resurrection, when we're in heaven, are we going to know one another? Well, the apostle Paul says that we will be fully known. And it's interesting when you go back into Matthew chapter 17, you will find that when Jesus went on the Mount of Transfiguration, two other individuals appeared, and it was Moses and Elijah, and the disciples were able to recognize from what Jesus was saying and and, and in seeing those men, and so they saw them bodily. Jesus rose bodily from the grave. As I mentioned last week in 1 John, John said, we have touched him, we have seen him, we have we have." walked with him we know that it's a literal body and because jesus did that you and i have the promise that we too will have a resurrection of our body a resurrection will not only be literal but it'll be a transformation it'll be a transformation now if you have your bibles turn to first corinthians chapter 15 i want to read several verses here but i want you to hear the key points in first corinthians chapter 15 And if you don't have your Bible with you, you write this scripture down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 45, and go home and reread these. But listen to what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15 as he discusses the resurrection and what it means. Beginning in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. 
It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. That's you and me. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. If we've accepted Jesus Christ and he has come into our life and given us his life, now we have become heavenly creatures. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be, what? Changed. There will be a transformation. He goes on to say, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The promise that you and I have because of Jesus' resurrection is that one day we too we'll have a resurrection of our physical body. It's going to be raised, and then it's going to be transformed. It'll be a new body. It won't be confined as our natural body. It won't have the problems uh, that our natural bodies do. It is going to be a immortal, incorruptible, heavenly body that's literal. How do we know that? Because Jesus literally walked after his resurrection. And so we too will be raised in the likeness of him. The Bible also tells us in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21, and you can see these, these verses on the screen, for our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will, say it with me, transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself the interesting thing is is that our resurrected body will have some connection with our natural body in the sense that we will be known as we are known now that raises a lot of other questions we don't have time to get into all of those today I just want to give you the resurrection promise that you and I can experience good in the grief, especially related to death, because when death comes and knocks on our door, if death takes us as it has taken many of our loved ones, we have the promise that we too will be resurrected. Aren't you thankful for that promise? Secondly, there will be a return of our Savior. There will be a return of our savior because of the resurrection he is going to return as i mentioned last week there are a lot of religious leaders who died some of them from illnesses some from natural causes but they all died and they were buried and guess what they're still there but our savior he rose from the dead and he is living today he ascended back to the father <laughs> and he's coming back again you see, not only is the resurrection unique to the Christian faith, but so is the return of Jesus Christ unique to the Christian faith in four different ways. First of all, the return of our Savior is going to be personal. I love John 14, 3, and I want you to see this, John 14, 3 where Jesus is talking to his disciples before he's going to be crucified, before everything goes into, into action of what's going to take place. He tells his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And watch this. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. 
My friend, I want you to know that is a promise that God is going to keep. The reason I know that is because he's kept all of his other promises. One day, Jesus is going to return, and he said, I will come. He's not going to send one of his angels. He's not going to send somebody else. He said, I am coming myself. Look again in our text of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. I want you to know, my friend, the return of Jesus is personal. The reason we know that is that the angels told those disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 11, this same Jesus that is taken up from you is going to come again in like manner as he was taken from you. It's going to be personal, but not only that, but it's going to be physical. I mean, he's not just coming back in spirit. He's coming back physically in his resurrected body. Just sort of like what I've already said in these verses, Jesus says, I'm coming myself. You're going to see me. You're going you're to know who I am. Now, there are some who believe that Christ came at Pentecost when the believers were filled with the Spirit. And in a sense, yes, Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. All three, but they all have different ministries. But I want you to know something. There are people that, that believe and, and say that that prophecy has been fulfilled of him coming again. But that's not the fulfilling of the promise, what Jesus said. He said, I'm going away, and I'm preparing a place for you, but I am going to come back. But I want you to see what he says in John 16, verse 7. He says, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Clearly designating that there is a different ministry between the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son ascended back into heaven. The the disciples watched him go into the clouds and disappear. And then 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and filled those disciples, and they they became bold and courageous witnesses for Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is still working today, walking, convicting, leading, guiding, instructing, filling people. But the sun is still in heaven at this moment. But he is going to come. The Bible is very clear about Jesus returning for his bride, the church, at the rapture. And that's what our text is talking about. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with, with a shout. And then in verse 17 he says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with who? With the dead in Christ who are going to rise first. We're all going to be joined together and meet the Lord in the air. It's going to be a personal and it's going to be a physical time of his returning First to receive the church, but then he's going to come and set foot up on earth one day as conqueror of the entire whole earth. But then we also find that the return of our Savior is going to be unexpected. The second coming and the rapture are two different events. The second coming, when Jesus actually returns and sets foot up on earth, is going to be preceded by some important signs. There's going to be the abomination of desolation where the sacrificial um, altar is going to be desolated and it's going to be abused. Then there's also going to be the great tribulation and then the sun is going to go completely dark according to Matthew chapter 24 verses 15 through 29. Those are the signs of the returning of Jesus to earth, but... The rapture is going to come suddenly. When Jesus calls the church, he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, but the Bible says we're going to meet him in the air. He's not coming all the way to the earth. The dead in Christ are going to rise. Then we which who are alive and remain, as Paul tells us, are going to be caught up together, and we're going to meet the Lord in the air, not on the earth, but in the air. So there's a distinct difference. The thing I want you to understand is there is nothing, there is nothing that has to happen before he comes. But it's going to be unexpected. The Bible talks to us about in Matthew chapter 24, two will be in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the mill, one will be taken, and one will be left. And look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 44. It says this, Therefore also you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. His return 
to get his church is going to be unexpected. But then fourthly, it's going to be imminent. Now what does the word imminent mean? It means it's about to happen at any moment. That means something is going to happen. Sometimes you hear about, sometimes people will refer to, well, they're at a place where it's imminent death. In other words, death is going to come at any moment. You may have sat by and watched one of your loved ones at the point of death, knowing that it's just a matter of time. And how that grieves us and how that brings sorrow to our heart. But I want you to know, The reality is any of us could die at any moment. We know that. We we need to constantly be aware of that. But can I tell you what Jesus' resurrection gives to us? The promise that he's going to return at any moment. And then the dead in Christ will rise. We who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And as I mentioned already, there is nothing holding his calling the church home. Nothing is holding that back. It could happen before I finish this message. The question is, is are you prepared at any moment for the return of our Savior? Yes, there's a promise of the resurrection of our body. Yes, there's a promise of the return of our Savior. But then thirdly, I want to share with you this. And this is what really brings us to the point of good grief. And it is this. There will be a reunion of our family. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I'm tired of death. Are you? I'm tired of seeing loved ones die and we can't talk with them we can't spend time with them but there is a promise (laughs) there's going to be a reunion in heaven when jesus returns notice again what the scripture says in the last part of verse 16 the dead in christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord and with those who have risen with him ladies and gentlemen I want to tell you I don't know about you but I remember as a small boy going to a lot of family reunions and I'm a smith and when you went to a family reunion there was a lot of smiths my dad was in a family of 17 brothers and sisters now some of them were half brothers and sisters but we would go and i'd have to ask mom and dad who are they well they're your relatives they're your uncle they're your aunt they're your cousins but boy i used to love those family reunions man everybody get together and man you go run and play and do all these kind of things and you don't see many family reunions much anymore but i'm here to tell you there's going to be a family reunion one day Some of you have lost your husband. Some of you have lost in death your wife, your parents, some even your children, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, grandparents, maybe even grandchildren. But can I tell you, in the midst of that sorrow, in the midst of the tears, and in the midst of the grief, of the death of family members and loved ones, those who die in Christ, we are promised a reunion in heaven. We will always be with the Lord. Aren't you looking for that? There's going to be a family reunion. It's not going to be a come and go. It's going to be a come and stay. We'll never be separated again. We'll never have to be parted again. We will be with our loved ones who have died in Christ. But not only with our family, but the most important of all, we'll spend eternity with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And see him face to face. And be able to say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for taking my place upon your cross. Thank you, Jesus, for dying so that I could live. 
and we'll spend eternity in heaven with him. Now, why does Paul write these words? In verse 18, it gives the reason why. Therefore, based upon what I've just told you, that there's going to be a resurrection of the body, that there's going to be a return of the Savior, and that there's going to be a reunion in eternity in heaven with our family. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. My friend, that's good grief. Comfort those who have had loved ones who have died. Because one day, Because Jesus came forth out of that grave and he's walking in that resurrection power so much that the Apostle Paul says, my prayer is is that I would know him and the power of his resurrection because of his resurrection. We know that we will be resurrected and our Savior will return and we're going to go spend eternity with him in heaven forever. That's good grief. And we can be comforted by these words. I want you to see this statement, and it's on your notes. The resurrection of Christ happened in history, and the power of that resurrection will raise us in the future. (laughs) Because Jesus lives, we will live. Because Jesus was resurrected, we will be resurrected. Let me close with this. As a young boy, some of you older folks might remember the old small red hymnal called the Inspirational Hymns. There's a song in there that I learned early on as a young boy because my parents would sing it almost uh, monthly at our church. But it's entitled, What a Day That Will Be. There's coming a day when no heartaches shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no burdens to bear, no sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Good grief. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope that we have in our grief. That because you died and you were buried, but you rose again, you have given us hope that when death knocks on the door of our loved ones, when death takes those who are closest to us, and even when death comes to our door, yet we can have and live and die in that hope that we are going to be resurrected like you were. And that you're going to come and receive us and our bodies are going to be raised out of that grave if we die before you return. And that old dusty physical body is going to be transformed into a glorious, immortal, incorruptible body. And we're going to be like you and we're going to meet you in the air and we're going to be forever with you. Oh, dear Lord, thank you for those promises. I pray that we will walk away from here today with a sense of comfort because we can have good grief. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, if you've never been forgiven by his grace, then I want to tell you something, those resurrection promises aren't for you. But if you'll give your life to Christ and you'll let him be your Savior and Lord, I'm here to tell you that those resurrection promises are yours. And you can have that hope. And death doesn't have to scare you. Listen, praise the Lord, all of us have known someone who has died and preceded us. 
If they are a child of God and they had their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I'm here to tell you that if you and if you and I, if we call ourselves Christians and we're followers of Jesus Christ, one day we're going to be reunited, never to be separated again. Do you have that hope? If not, I invite you to come. Maybe God's calling you to come and publicly like like uh, Monica did uh, to come with Zane and, and with Michael to simply say, I, I've trusted Christ, but I've never followed the Lord and believers' baptism. If that's where you are, then you come today. We would love to help you take that step of obedience. Maybe God's calling you to come and unite with the fellowship of this church. You be obedient to the Lord's will because his resurrection promises are here for us to claim today. Let's stand together and you lead us in singing. And if God is speaking to your heart, you come this morning. Wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming. so much for your presence today i hope and pray that you'll have a wonderful day and again we rejoice with the doyle family we are so grateful and proud to have them come and be a part of our church fellowship and they've been been coming and uh, been involved and so we praise the lord for that and it's just it's a great time that we're seeing a lot more things opening up so good to see so many people that haven't been here in in quite some time because of covid and all the other stuff going on we're just so glad that you're here and we're so thankful that God is watching over to you. To our guests, we invite you to come back and worship with us again. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon us, and then we'll be dismissed to Sunday school. Brother Stephen, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Father, thank you for the morning. Lord, I thank you for your blessing our house this morning with the knowledge of your presence in, in addition to the fellowship here at this church. Lord, help us to be good stewards of all that you send our way, e even the souls and spirits that you send to be part of this congregation. Bless them this day. And Lord, bless us as we go the rest of this day. Study your word and live for you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. If you'd like one of these Easter lilies up here to take home with you and plant, just come pick you one out, take it home, give it a good home today. Thank you.